Hey guys, so now we're looking at another type of um, support media, packaging and point of purchase or point of sales sometimes it's called. And it's about standing out in a sea of clutter, but also realizing that packaging is another form of media that advertisers and marketers can use to grab the attention of audiences and attract them to purchasing a brand. Here's the overview slide. So we've gone through the first lecture, which was on broadcast media. The second, which was on print. Um, last time it was support media in terms of out of home advertising. Today we're looking at uh, the fourth uh, sub chapter of this module, which is support media in terms of packaging and point of purchase. So packaging acts not only as a form of protection for the product, but also a way of storing the product and making it manageable. But it also acts as a form of communication. You have to think of every package as a five second commercial. In the previous lecture, I ended with that slide of that supermarket shelf space with all the different brands. And that really is the reality of what brands have to compete with. All these competing brands all crying out for attention. So how can you use your packaging to really stand out um, in a way that would attract your audience to your brand? So some of the aims of packaging then, obviously to draw attention, as I've mentioned, and that is certainly the intention of all media. You want to break through that competitive clutter at the point of purchase. So it doesn't matter how much advertising you do for most products, right? Uh, it will all bottleneck at this point of sale or this point of purchase. Um, all the TV ads, the radio ads, the magazine, it's all channeling people to get them to usually this retail place. And at that point, they purchase the product. So if your package doesn't stand up to the competition at that point, then you've essentially wasted all the money and time you've invested into advertising because you've gotten people to the shop, but once they're in the store, they still have to make that decision. And we know that you know more than 70% of decisions are made in the store at that point of sale. Uh, and that's another reason why sales promotion as a promotional element is becoming so successful because if you can convert behavior at that point of sale, then it essentially negates all the competitive advertising that has led people to that point. And so packaging is a very important medium at that last point when a person is deciding whether they buy your product or the competitor's product. You're using the packaging also to justify your brand image and your brand reputation. You want to justify the price and the value of your product to that customer. There's no point having all this fancy advertising in the best uh, magazines in the world um, at the Super Bowl. Um, but when a person goes to the store to buy a product, the packaging looks all tatty and cheap and it's crumpled or doesn't protect the product in a good way um, or it makes the product really flimsy and clumsy to use, right? So it all has to kind of integrate um, within an IMC framework to convey the brand values that you want to convey. And you're using packaging to signify various brand features and benefits to the audience. You can also use packaging to convey emotionality, right? So we know that certain packages and certain designs will evoke certain emotions. And we'll look at that a little bit later with some examples. At the end of the day, you're using packaging as yet another motivator for the consumer to choose your brand. Uh, TV, you know, radio, um, magazines, newspaper, transit, all of that gets their attention, informs them, maybe reminds them, persuades them, to get them all to that point of purchase. Um, but to really motivate them, they're going to be deciding between this box versus that box. Uh, there might be some sales promotions thrown in as part of the integrated marketing communications campaign, um, but it will still be very much based on the look and feel of that product at that given time and the price at which it's positioned. And in some rare cases, the packaging is the actual product. So I won't give you the answer to that now. Just have to think about, you know, circumstances in your own purchasing um, history where you've actually bought something not Man, not because of the advertising or, or the product, but maybe the package. There's something about the package itself that made the product so cool you thought you had to buy it for the packaging. This example here is Aquaticus, which is an organic um, fish fertilizer. Uh, it's a brand that I consulted on and the repackaging of, of this brand. So what you'll see there is that it's a blue bottle 
which um, initially was uh, made sense uh, for the client because it was the only uh, blue bottle on the shelf in garden centers. Uh, everything else, as you would expect, would be green, right? Uh, and so in terms of standing out, that made sense. But then everything else didn't really make sense. Um, a, it wasn't um, a product particularly um, targeted at roses, and it was an all-purpose sort of general organic fertilizer. Um, and the blue did not really convey the organic, sustainable nature of this brand. Um, so the special thing about Aquaticus is it's made of the um, the fish waste that is created out of the fishing industry. So as you know, when a fisher goes out and he brings back a lot of um, you know fish uh, up to the quota that he or she is allowed, um, some of that uh, gets sold, but a lot of it has to be gutted and processed. Um, and it's the gutting and process that creates a lot of waste. Uh, which is, you know, kind of rotten fish guts, right? Not very pleasant, but really good for your plants. Um, it's organic, uh, it's rich in certain nutrients. Um, and what my client here was able to do was to combine that fish waste with a plant probiotic called Trichoderma. Uh, and that acts as an inoculator, uh, an inoculation uh, for the plant's root system to defend it from other um, diseases, fungal diseases and other microbe diseases. Um, so it's a very good product, uh, and it's a lot of its positioning is based around this organic, sustainable angle, which isn't really conveyed in the packaging, the old packaging that you see there. So what we did, uh, along with the branding agency that I subcontracted for, Richard's Partners, is that we revamped the whole brand. Uh, you'll notice there with the new packaging and for the four different products, uh, green is a go-to color when you're trying to convey organic and sustainable values. Uh, the background for the shelf display, that sort of cardboard recycled um, look, once again, trying to get that sustainability question in there. Uh, and even though we lost out on not having this um, that blue color, which stood out, um, we went for color blocking in another sense. And so you'll notice how when the package is displayed there, it still creates a block of color and a certain pattern system that enables the consumer to be drawn to it and understand it all belongs to the same brand. So those four products, even though they look slightly different, share the same color codes, and more importantly, share that mental scaffolding of the circle, uh, the quarter circle that all combines into what you see on the right there are those four different functional uses of that brand, to condition, to boost, to control, and to protect, right? And so that enables the consumer to very quickly realize that these these products belong to the same brand, that this brand uh, should be thought of as sustainable and organic because the colors uh, almost subconsciously provide that. Um, and now with the way the system works together in that, uh, with that circular uh, framework, gives a slightly scientific feel uh, to, that, to that brand. So you can see this packaging, um, you know, really brought to the fore the, the main uh, product attributes, uh, the main benefits of that product. So what did we do to come up with that sort of design? Well, there, is, um, there are certain things you want to think of when you are dealing with packaging. So the first is sensation transference. So this is um, when dealing with the way something feels translates to the way you feel about the brand. Now, Apple is a classic example of this for any of you that own Apple products is when you unbox Apple, you immediately get this sense of superior design, uh, really professional, perfectionistic type product, right? Uh, down to the cardboard and the seams and the clean edges that the product comes in. And that emotion, so you're already um, developing a, a attitude towards the brand and an emotion towards the brand before you've even touched the brand, just simply by holding and unboxing the brand. So that's the packaging uh, working in that way. The color, so we already established that much meaning is associated with colors, with your greens and your browns associated with sustainability and organic stuff, your red with excitement and um, hedonism, blue with, for refreshing and cooling, um, etc, etc. The design and shape cues, so various um, shapes and lines, whether something is curvy might signify a feminine type product or something is jagged and edgy and sharp, right? So the different design cues will elicit different sort of um, perceptions of the brand and the product. The size, so 
you know, if you have a large product, then that signifies bulk value and may also encourage more consumption because when people have more, they typically use more. So you see this happen all the time with um, toilet paper, right? You get the massive 24 uh, pack, um, which signifies bulk value. Um, but then if you have 24 rolls of new toilet paper, you probably end up going through a lot quicker uh, than if you only had a four pack. Um, physical materials, so whether it's made of metal, or whether it's made of wood or whether it's made of plastic. So all these things within a, a, a package um, will signify certain values to the audience. VIEW is an acronym that helps sort of summarize the different types of way of evaluating and creating packaging. So uh, the V part stands for visibility and the point of any package is to attract attention. Um, and you can do so in a way that still makes people realize it's part of a certain group or class of products. So if we go back to that previous example of Aquaticus, you'll remember the original bottle was blue. So that worked well in terms of attracting attention because it was the only blue thing on the shelf. But at the same time, it didn't work well because people saw blue and they automatically don't think that it's an organic or sustainable product. And they also don't know what exactly that product is because if everything else is green uh, or brown uh, what is this blue thing right and unless they're really willing to go up to that product and look at it and understand what it is they might just ignore it and just go to the next most familiar brand that they understand that seems to fit in with that category so when you're designing packaging to attract attention it's a fine line between standing out too much and then failing to you know acknowledge that you belong to a certain product category uh, versus blending in too much, right? So you want to get that balance. You want to stand out, but you don't want to be thought of as so different that you're not even in the consideration set anymore. But at the same time, you don't want to blend in so much that people just sort of overlook you and think you're part of some other brand. So it's a very fine line. And we thought we were able to achieve that with Aquaticus because even though we use similar colors to other brands, uh, no one else had that circular framework with the four different functions. And because we, we had that angled in a way that was very different to the other um, design cues that were on the shelf at the time, uh, we thought that that stood out enough. Uh, the I part of the VIEW acronym is information, so this plays a huge role in packaging because this is the last point of contact that someone has before they decide whether they buy your brand or the competing brand. So while they're looking at that, you're obviously trying to stimulate them to trial your product, to purchase it, right? So the information there has to be convincing. You want to encourage them to repeat purchase as well. Um, you're providing instructions on how to use the product. So that's a very important part of packaging, whether it's nutritional value or how to mix up uh, you know, this fertilizer so that you don't kill your plants. Uh, this is very important. So the technical writing involved um, has to be such that the user experience is better, not worse, after taking the advice on the package. And you're using the package once again to reinforce advertising messages. So within an IMC or integrated marketing communications framework, you want all touch points to say the same thing. And so it doesn't make sense to advertise one thing, but then have the package say something completely different, right? So that's common sense. The E part of the view framework is emotional appeal. So we mentioned earlier how certain um, packaging and the colors and the design and the material will evoke a certain mood. Uh, Apple being a great example of that sort of elegant design uh, and uh, getting a, a product perfect uh, right down to the very lines that make the box fit together. Uh, and so what packaging does is it tries to get this emotional appeal happening at that point of purchase. So if something feels really nice uh, when you're looking at it or you're touching it on the shelf compared to something that doesn't feel as nice, feels a bit tinny, maybe a bit cheap, a bit crinkly, then you might start to lean towards the one with the better packaging if that price is within that range that you're happy to pay. And finally, workability. So here we're talking about protection, storage, simplifying that usage and also having to consider now more than ever the environmental impacts of your packaging, right? So we all know about the single use um, plastic um, anti-movement and packaging obviously has a large role uh, in that sort of disaster um, that we have. Uh, and so now, you know, when you design packaging, uh, you have to consider what happens to the package after the consumer has used the product. Here are some examples of packaging, which I thought were worth mentioning. This is a really cool example of a drink. And uh, obviously the design is such that you look like you're kissing that person when you're drinking the uh, beverage. 
Here's a really cool example of throat lozenges. So you start off with a constricted throat and as you unravel the lozenge, it you know, pretty much tells you what it's going to do in a very sort of funny and humorous uh, and um, creative fashion. Um, here's an example of a laundry detergent that is shaped like a laundry machine. Uh, and below, when I asked you earlier to think about products where you buy the packaging uh, more so than the product, Perfumes are a great example of where this might happen. Certainly you, you know, want to like the smell of the product you're buying, but often the package that the perfume comes in uh, does most of the selling for you, for the, for the manufacturer, right? If you have a really fancy um, bottle of perfume that looks really good, like a piece of art almost, um, that has a huge influence on whether someone buys it, particularly as a gift, um, you know, but also for themselves. And as I mentioned before, sometimes people even collect packages, right? So Fez is a great example. Uh, Pez, uh, the confectionery dispenser. So really, if you think about the, the view model here, um, it's attracting the attention. It's providing a little bit of information on how to use the product um, in terms of the cardboard that the Pez dispenser would have come in. Um, but the emotion of fun, playful, collectible, childhood nostalgia is conveyed in the Pez dispenser. And finally, the workability is a large part of it, right? So here you have something that is a collectible, so hopefully it's not disposed of and causing pollution, but also it helps pop that candy out in a way that's now classic to that brand. Um, and it's so popular now that, you know, there are literally collectors and museums of um, people that collect Pez um, dispensers. But on the negative side of packaging, so we talked about single use, you know, plastic and pollution and how workability also considers the environmental impacts of packaging. Um, I've got a colleague at the business school in Manchester who did some really interesting work on the effects of brand, the effects of litter on brand image, right? Uh, and to just illustrate kind of, you know, what his, um, his, his study was about. Uh, remember the last time you might have been taking a walk in the park or the beach or driving along and you saw some litter? Typically that litter is branded, right? So the example here we have unfortunately is McDonald's. Uh, now it's not 100% McDonald's fault because they didn't throw that out there, but they are responsible in some way because it is still their packaging, right? And they have made it single use, which means that inherently it's disposable. Now while they would prefer that people dispose of this in a you know, ethical way, putting it into the rubbish bin, they can't control what people do. So in the past, you know, the business was never held accountable for the, this sort of activity where things are, you know, not only causing, uh, you know, unpleasant sort of environmental um, pollution, but also sometimes dangerous in the case of the Bud Light bottle here. So what responsibility is it of the brand to try to mitigate some of these th things that happen? And in the past, it wasn't really the responsibility. They would say, well, we make it, we can't control how people dispose of it. But I think as we move into the future, we'll see that more and more companies uh, will take it upon themselves to try and mitigate some of these environmental um, issues caused by their packaging. So for the example of McDonald's, we already know that they're uh, cutting down on um, plastic straws because they end up in the ocean. And so they're coming up with biodegradable straws. But before they could do that, they had to ensure there was enough people that could make biodegradable straws to supply McDonald's because, um, you know, they use a lot of these straws. Um, what about, you know, a package that isn't single use? What about a person that actually owns some sort of slightly fancier and less single use version of a Big Mac container? And if they bring that Big Mac container to McDonald's, they get a 10 or 15% discount, right? A, that would stop um, litter from happening from McDonald's, but B, it would also encourage repeat purchase. Um, so these and other sort of thoughts around how companies and brands might mitigate the impacts of the environment from their packaging are worth thinking about, particularly if you're working for brands whose positioning is about some sort of environmental imperative. Now we're talking about point of purchase materials, or POP. Sometimes they are also called point of sale materials, not re no real difference between those two um, acronyms. Um, they are classified among, in several different ways. So time, the amount of time that they spend at that point of purchase is one uh, really easy way of classifying them. So we've got permanent point
point of purchase displays, then they exist within that retail environment for six months or more. Then you get the semi-permanent ones that exist for about two months. And then you get temporary ones that are just, you know, promotion based, right? And they happen for less than two months. Here are some examples. Um, oh, and before I move on to the examples, some in-store media as well that you might see within the supermarkets, within the retail environments. Now, more sometimes these retailers are actually creating their own um, media channels in order to broadcast the, their own specials. So if you go to Countdown, often you'll hear that they've got the music, but they actually own that particular channel because you'll also hear that they will announce their own specials every now and then. Um, and if that gets really successful uh, for companies such as Countdown, where they can guarantee a lot of traffic, uh, foot traffic within their stores, then what's to stop them from selling advertising space on the very own media channels that they've created. So if you recall in my last lecture, we talked about Red Bulletin and how that was a very successful um, concept of how a brand creates their own content to promote their brand, but they do it so well that they can sell advertising space on their own promotional vehicle. This could fully happen with retail environments that can guarantee a certain amount of foot traffic. Uh, petrol stations is another good one, right? So sometimes you'll see now when you go into petrol stations, a display screen, uh, they own that, uh, those, the screen and, and the advertising space available to that because they know that across the number of petrol outlet stores that they have throughout the country, that is actually a lot of foot traffic that is going up to the cash register and looking at that screen. So they could potentially sell that, the advertising space on that screen as a in-store media and then own that as another um, revenue stream. Um, so some of this in-store media traditionally are promoting in-store coupons, announcements, all that sort of stuff, usually to promote the, the retail, uh, the store's own business, but nothing uh, stopping that from being extended to other brands um, beyond that retail environment. Here's an example of uh, in-store displays. Uh, so these will be familiar to you, if not the exact brand, but certainly the, the intent of these. So they're trying to attract attention at that point of purchase so that people will, you know, go up to the display and, and, and take some of those products. And often they are integrated with some sort of uh, limited sales promotion to try and increase that, that level of engagement. Uh, here's a social marketing example. So in some countries, you need to put a dollar into the trolley in order to take it out. Um, and then you get the dollar back when you return the trolley and pop the lock back in the other side. Um, what this uh, particular campaign does is puts a, a child's face where the dollar goes, uh, signifying that it takes a dollar, uh, only a dollar to feed um, kids in these developing nations. So the aims of point of Purchase advertising is similar to most advertising to inform, to remind, and to encourage or persuade people to purchase that particular product or do something in store. Um, but they can also act as a form of merchandising. So there, if you think about the retail space like a supermarket, there's a very regimented, you know, shelf system, right? There's rows and rows, um, and they're very uniform. What some of these point of purchase displays uh, do is they create additional real estate at the edges where there's a little bit of space and it creates more advertising space to merchandise a certain product, right? So if you think about the examples in the previous slide, you could get the painkiller, Advil, uh, in the you know pharmaceutical aisle, um, but that point of display exists beyond that pharmaceutical aisle. So it's another place where merchandising can happen. And so it's making more effective use of the limited space that retailers um, have. They influence unplanned purchasing. So a lot of purchases happen, you know, at that point of purchase rather than pre-planned. So a person might go in the store planning to buy a certain brand, but something might attract them to buy a different brand. And point of purchase advertising uh, is quite successful at doing that, uh, particularly if combined with sales promotion at that point of sale. So, right, so it's working on this impulse, uh, or maybe sometimes just reminding people to buy a certain brand uh, that they forgot to add to their shopping list. Now, Depending on the type of shopping trip, the personality characteristics of the consumer, whether they use lists or not, and the amount of time they spend and the number of aisles they traverse, um, that will all influence their 
unplanned purchasing. Um, but in the next slide, I'll show you some stats and some data on how uh, the the percentage of unplanned purchasing is increasing and hence why these point of purchase um, advertising displays are, are so effective. Um, and it could also be that they are increasing the amount of unplanned purchasing simply by being there. And so you've got this upward spiral of more point of purchase advertising being invested into, which leads to people making more unplanned in-store purchases, which proves their success and you have this upscaling effect. So here's a uh, table which is also available in the textbook, basically just showing you know, the different types of purchasing behavior that can happen in the store from one which is specifically planned, so this is something you go in with an intention to buy and then you buy it, to so a specific brand. Um, number two is generally planned, so you want to buy some sort of you know toilet paper or uh, painkiller, you're not quite sure, but you know you want some sort of toilet paper or painkiller by the time you leave the, the supermarket. Um, and then you, depending on what you see uh, at that point of sale, you might get convinced to buy one brand versus another brand. Uh, the third is substitute. So this is when you go in with the intention of buying something like Panadol, but then you leave with something like Voltaren. Uh, and often that is because something has happened in the store at that point of purchase to convince you to swap, switch brands at that last second. And finally, unplanned. So you didn't know that you even wanted, you know, some sort of painkiller. Uh, you went in and then something happened in the store that reminded you or convinced you that you do, in fact, need to buy stock up on, on painkiller. And point of purchase displays uh, obviously have a role in, in causing people to have uh, these unplanned um, uh, outcomes. And the last row there basically adds up all the various forms of in-store in decisions. So that's two, three, and four. And you'll see basically that um, since the 1970s, it's been on the increase. So 2012 was the last um, time this table was updated, I guess. Um, and it had the in-store decision rate at 76%. So that's quite high if you think about it. So three in every four decisions you make in the store are made in the store rather than you specifically plan to buy a brand and you go in and leave with what you had in mind. So why some of these point of purchase materials not used given how successful they are in promoting in-store decisions? So at the end of the day, it's still the retailers that decide whether these point of purchase materials are used or not. And a lot of them aren't used. And the reason why they may not be used is inappropriate design, right? So they might, you know, just not look a certain way uh, given the store's preferences, or it might not work a certain way. Uh, it could be that it's also too big in terms of the merchandising that it can create, and therefore it just clutters up the, the aisles or the, the, the cornering of the trolleys around each shelf. Uh, and so it's too much trouble. Basically, if it's too much trouble for the retailer, it doesn't guarantee enough turnover of product, then they will say no to it. They could be too hard to use, too hard to set up. So in my younger days, I worked for a company called Field Force, and part of this was in-store uh, sampling. Uh, so I was the person that would walk around with either chocolates or something to, to give to uh, people in the supermarket. Uh, and sometimes I had to set up you know, your stall. And those, some of you will probably be working in the same type of job. And you'll know what a pain it is if you have a setup that is very difficult to use and you've got the materials all over and then people start to get annoyed because they have to work around you. So a retailer is not going to take the chance that, you, that that will ruin the shopping experience of its customers. It will just say no. Uh, and pack it up, um, you, you know, because the most important thing for the retailer is the amount of turnover. Um, and so if something doesn't, you know, look right, feel right, or disrupts the consumer experience or looks ugly in terms of lack of aesthetics, then they will say no, they won't want to use it. Um, and the final reason is that sometimes these displays, even though they're very good at um, turning over profit, might only do so for one brand. And if it starts to do that at the expense of another brand that gives the retailer a higher profit margin, then the retailer will still say no. Because you have to remember that the retailer is not particularly loyal to any one brand. They just want to turn over as much product as possible and preferably as much product with the highest profit margin for them as possible.
Hence, they always prioritize their in-home brands, their, you know, the signature ranges and the PAMs, um, because they get the highest profit margin on those. And that's why they are always at that premium shelf space, eye level. Right. But to relate this to point of purchase materials, a lot of these point of purchase materials will only come from manufacturers of national brands. So these are the brands such as, you know, Kellogg's, um, Watties. So these are those brands that are, um, you know, popular for customers, but don't necessarily give the retailer the best profit margin. Um, and so while the retailer is happy for these point of purchase materials to exist, to get the turnover up and to help create more effective use of the floor, limited floor space they have, um, if it starts to cut into their profit margin because it's cannibalizing other brands that may perhaps provide a better profit margin, then they could still say no to those point of purchase materials. So next time we're going to look at promotional products, which is another area, another medium that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, and we'll finish off with some sample test items.